My name is Ronika Jacobs and you found my podcast, Strive for More, Your Best Life Now. While there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, you've taken the time out to listen to this one. So for that, I would like to say thank you. So without any further delay, let's get to it. Let's strive for more. My next guest, Norman McCombs, is striving for more in the area of relationships and Alzheimer awareness. Norm is an esteemed engineer who received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation by President Obama in 2011. His upcoming beautifully written literary novel tackles Alzheimer's, grief, depression, redemption, and finding love after loss through exploring cultural heritage. In this episode, he will discuss loss, grieving, and finding his identity in his search for his Scottish heritage. Hi, Norman. Welcome. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. How are you? Hi, Veronica. Now, you received the National Medal of Technology and Innovation from President Obama in 2011. Can you share some details about this particular award? Sure. Actually, I received it in 2013. They were two years behind. So I was honored on paper in in 2011, but 2013 is actually when I went to the White House. And it was was called the National Medal of Technology and Innovation, and he gave it to me for work I had done in the development of oxygen concentrators. They're devices that are used to as a supplemental aid for oxygen to those in need with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cancer, emphysema, respiratory problems in general. I developed a system that replaced the need for high-pressure cylinders and delivery of oxygen on a weekly basis. It's an appliance that you, you plug in a wall, separates air, and delivers oxygen on demand. And that's... The last thing I did was to make it suitable for airline use. We got it down to only weighing just a couple pounds, and it allowed people to fly. And that's what got people with COPD to fly, and that's what caught certain people's attention, and I was honored with this highest award I could ever imagine. It was wow, that's tremendous. amazing. Unfortunately, it was rather bittersweet because that was in the – in the, I was in the middle of caring for my my wife suffering from uh, Alzheimer's, and I was able to take her with me to the White House, but as I say, it was a bittersweet situation. Retrospectively, I, I have more positive thoughts about it now than I than I did, but it was, it was a difficult time, but again, a, the highest award I could receive, and I'm very thankful for it. Well, congratulations on that. Whenever we can receive a high honor as a civilian, that's, I mean, it's always magnificent. And it, and so is that in the area of biomedical engineering in a sense? Yes, it is. Mechanical, electrical engineering. I have a doctorate in science for certain developmental work I did. But I, I was involved in the establishment of a biomedical curriculum at University of Buffalo. So I'm, they referred to me as their first biomedical engineer. Well, I asked you that, and that's really awesome because my son, my oldest son, he wants to become a biomedical engineer. So he's taking robotics and engineering right now, and he loves science. And his one of his statements to me once was, Mom, I, I want to help people medically. Like, I want to create 
artificial limbs and organs and find cures for different diseases and help people breathe better. So I, it's really neat that our paths have crossed because my son is really interested in that area. So the fact that you have won an award for helping people with COPD in that field, I just it just gave me chills right now <laughs> because that could be my son one day. Yeah. Well, frankly, I'd be happy to talk to him anytime. <laughs> I encourage young oh, men women awesome. to, to get into biomedical field. Many of the, the young people that I've dealt with, mentored over the years, have actually gone from biomedical engineering. Uh, they've gone to medical school afterwards and complemented it, which is a, a good fit for a lot of young people, young men and women. So he might consider that. Yeah. And he, well, he, he might... But you might bring that up with him. He might consider looking further into the future, even beyond that, and becoming MD. Because it's uh, once you get into the biomedical field, you if you get into it, become an MD, you become a very effective MD. You understand the mechanics of things and the logic of it. So anyway, it might be something he should consider. Well, I can say that anything that he builds, I mean, I can buy, I can purchase a Lego set for him, and I mean, he can build it in a matter of days. I mean, and I mean, I'm talking about <laughs> ones with hundreds and thousands of parts and he barely uses the you know direction the instructions that come with it it's it's amazing yeah it's amazing and sometimes he'll just build you know kind of just free form and just build things on his own ships and all kinds of robots and different things and so it's just amazing you know that he can do that like a fascinating young man how old is he (laughs) yes he's 13 okay the formative age now is the time. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Well, he's taking robotics and engineering uh, right now in school, and then he also is is taking pre AP science in uh, school. So he's in seventh grade, and he loves both. And he's a, he's also always at math. Yeah, I was going to ask how he's at mathematics. That's a big part of engineering these days. Yeah, he's a whiz at math, and the, all of that is interesting because he also has high-functioning autism and ADHD, but he does very well, oh, and he del- those are his areas of interest. Well, you should be very proud of him. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. It's a real credit to you, though, Monica, that I, I have a niece who is a high-functioning autism, but it can be a challenge, so it's a, I understand what you may have gone through, but... So it's a credit to you as well. Yes, most definitely. We have our good days and our bad days, but, you know, he's so smart and it's amazing how how he can figure things out and how he can see how things, he can take things apart, put them back together. And it's amazing just how the mind works because really with autism, it's really more of a communication disorder yes. more than anything. And so he may not be able to communicate very well, and socially is where he struggles, but at the same time, as far as the mechanics, things, and technology, hands down, he has no problem with that. Now, he can communicate that. And Mm -hmm. another area of interest he has is ants, and he likes to study ants, and he can tell you all about ants and their complex systems, and, (laughs) you know, and he can tell you all about it. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. Well, unfortunately, we must deal with the loss of someone close to us in one way or another in our lifetime. What is your perspective on tackling and overcoming grief and loss? I'm not, I must say I'm not good at it. It never was. It's, I, I have a very difficult time, difficult time losing pets, so I don't grieve well, but one thing that I do, I find that everyone must keep in mind when they go through something like I did with, when I was caring for my wife with Alzheimer's, get outside help, get others to help you. Don't be alone. I decided that I could take care of her alone, and it drove me into the ground. Get outside help. There's lots of help out there, Alzheimer's Association, friends, relatives. Get outside help. You can. It's so easy to obsess about grief, and it's, it can be deadly. So get help. Don't just dwell on it. Obsess about it. Get out there and ask for help. Or it maybe from church. There are again the Alzheimer's Association. They have groups that get together and talk. Just talk about it. I had suffered the loss of my mother and my my father, but it was nothing like 
just watching my poor wife Grace disappear before my eyes. And the name of the book is A Reason to Be. And my only reason to be for six and a half years was caring for my wife, Grace. That was my only reason to be. And when I lost her, I, I lost all reason to be. And I just went off and wandered, got, finally got back into my profession of friends. Again, people recognized that I needed help, and they, they stepped in. God bless them. Yeah, whenever we can have a support system to help us and aid us in grief, I've found that, you know, it really makes a tremendous difference instead of going at it alone. And I really have found, and I don't know if you agree with this, but I really found it it almost is a source of strength when you have that people there. At first we think it's a sign of weakness by thinking we have to lean on people, but really it it ends up being a, a source of strength for for us. Well, as a scientist, as an engineer, I'm used to solving problems, and I felt that I could solve that problem. And I felt sure that there was something people were missing about Alzheimer's and dreaded missing something that's going on out there that I didn't know about. That After all these years, it still hasn't happened, but I just dwelled on it and dwelled on it, obsessed about it. And I lost contact with the outside world. I had businesses, uh, very active in a lot of things, but I just lost contact. And that's the worst thing I could have done. I should have maintained contact. Then it's all retrospective. The first chapter of my book addresses me gradually coming out of depression and through the help of a friend who was very real. Semi-autobiographic, I'd say emotionally it's 100% nonfiction. From a dialogue perspective, it's 100% fiction. From the factual presentation about my relatives and so forth is about 75% nonfiction. So my relatives are all real in it. But throughout the whole period, I was searching for a reason to be, to get up in the morning. Why do, Why am I getting up in the morning? I just, why bother? And people struggle through that. So, again, that's where the the name come from came from, just trying to find a reason to be again. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Now, I know I've heard the term Alzheimer's disease, and I, I do understand it's a deterioration of the mind. And, and maybe there are other people out there who are listening just like myself. We kind of don't really understand what Alzheimer's really is and what actually happens to a person who is afflicted with Alzheimer's. So can you kind of share information exactly to kind of educate us? about what what exactly is Alzheimer's disease? Well, to the best of my ability, I can. It's a shrinkage of certain parts of the brain, the loss of what we call synapses that interlink various functions of the brain. It shows up, MRI is a shrinkage in certain areas, and it's, it's a progressive disorder that really there's nothing that can stop it at this point in time. We've tried everything. I'm in the oxygen business. It was proposed that putting the individual into a high-pressure oxygen chamber helped, but, and I put a lot of faith and I did a lot of work on that, but it, it didn't help at all. So I became totally frustrated, and at one point I totally, completely demoralized. I realized there was nothing I could do. But it's basically a shrinkage of the brain, certain parts of it, and depending upon what part of the brain is affected, the symptoms change are, are different. Some people have Alzheimer's and they still recognize their loved ones to a certain degree. Others, they don't recognize anybody. It progresses at some very rapidly. Others, it takes a long time. In my wife's case, it took six and a half years. And of horror, it's, I call it, it's an unholy disease. I think all diseases are, but Alzheimer's is is unholy. You know, to see someone disappear before your eyes and there's nothing you can do about it. And particularly as a scientist, I have this big ego that I thought, oh, I can, I can solve that. I can help this, and it was just zero success. So I, I wound up taking care of the best I could until I I could not get out of bed anymore myself, and then I had to call in help. So I decided to write about the best I could but the Alzheimer's aspect of my life and how I dealt with it and that I survived. I didn't think I was going to survive, frankly. I, just, I didn't think I was going to survive, period. I got through it. 
and that's what the first part of the book is about. And my friend suggests that I go back and do what I said I was always going to do, was write about my ancestry. So I I got help doing that and found a lot of interesting things about my ancestry. And in so doing, I, I think I learned a lot about myself by looking back at who my ancestors were. There are a lot of interesting people. And it was so it was therapeutic for me in the sense that I, I finally unloaded how I felt about the su- surviving Alzheimer's and and also the looking back at where I came from, uh, who I was. I think we all wonder about that. You know, where did we come from? And the last part of it is about love because, you know, I've tried to def- decide come to terms with what is the difference between devotion and love what's the difference between obligation and love and so the last part of it is coming up with my definition of true love as an energy force that never really disappears in the universe so it's a combination of survival of Alzheimer's historical a genealogical search and a love story combined well well, Norman, I I must first just I applaud you and I commend you for your resilience and just your dedication. That is amazing. I know sometimes we can beat ourselves up about certain things, but at the same time, we forget to give ourselves an incredible amount of grace as well for the time that we were committed or dedicated to whatever task or challenge that we had to deal with. Although we don't always get the outcome <laughs> that we desire, but the fact that we stuck with it throughout the process, we need to celebrate that and acknowledge every effort in the things that we do. So I applaud you. Now I want to switch to for being a mechanical and electrical engineer and shifting to become to decide to become an author. I mean, many people desire to do it, but you actually took the plunge. So yeah. how did you decide to do that? Well, when I was a young, very, I used to write novels, uh, fiction, submit them to Saturday Evening Post and Colliers and the like when I was very young. And I, so I liked to write a great deal, but then I diverted my interest to science and engineering. Cause I've, the way you describe your son was not like that. So I became, I got off that track. But in the back of my mind, I always thought that I would get back to writing at some point in my life. And... Along the way, I found out through a particular website about some of my relatives who I found were quite interesting, back to the 15th, 15th century Scotland. So I made the decision to write about that eventually, and then Grace left me. And a very difficult time getting back to it, but with the help of others, I, I decided to do what I had talked about my a friend of mine, Mark, he's, he always remembered me talking about about writing and convinced me that I should I should try to come out of my depression using that as a tool. But ultimately, it, it helped a great deal. I went, to, I went to Scotland to investigate where my relatives actually came from, met a lot of interesting people. My, yeah, I want to talk to you about that. I want you to share that experience in particular Please share your experience with, because I know that's a part of your book as well. But I don't, I don't want you to give too much away <laughs> of the book. But okay. yeah, please share with the listeners what that process was like in that journey to discover your Scottish heritage, and then, like you said, you actually went to Scotland as well. So, what was that like? It was fascinating because I kept on coming upon people that I found interesting, <laughs> and. The 15th, back to the 15th century when the clan, my clan is called McThomas. That's where McCombs comes from, from the Gaelic pronunciation of Thomas, McComb. And going, I went right back to the beginning because we were part of the McIntosh clan and there was a big battle and that's where that, the clan, my clan started by a fellow named Big Thomas and he was my 13th great grandfather. And it's I found a lot about clans and how they work and 
the fact that no one is given anything in the clan that they have to earn it. There's no no such thing as like a royal family as like as in England. It, it, if you were to be a leader, you had to be the strongest and smartest and earn that position. And your children didn't inherit anything. So it was a survival of the fittest, and those people that were the strongest led. And in, in the northern Scotland, there was a tough place to live. The weather and they had eliminated all of the the forests up there, and they had to be strong to survive. So that was very interesting to me to learn about that and how my relatives went to Northern Ireland. Cromwell gave a lot of the land to Scottish people. He, he Scottish Protestants, that he was very anti-Catholic, Cromwell. So he gave land away to the Scots. That's where the trouble started in Northern Ireland. The, the battle between the Protestants and the Catholics. And finally, one one of them, a fellow named John Gordon, moved to the United States and brought his sons with him. And he did. My, his two of his sons were quite interesting. One helped found this actually found the New York Stock Exchange, and his son won the first Congressional Medal of Honor in the War of 1812. Another one was a spy in Canada for the United States, and a lot of a lot of interesting things, a lot of things to write about. I found some very strong women in my past. Tried to concentrate on them a bit because the name, you know, we lose with our heritage. We really lose the female contribution because the name is lost the women's name is lost they absorbed the name of the husband and so i tried to best i could to make sure i indicated the strength of the women involved in the process so again it was a fascinating for me i followed my alexander mccomb was buried in the congressional cemetery he's the one that won the congressional medal of honor for the War of 1812, we visited him, visited Arlington, visited the homestead in Canada. So it, it was quite a journey. It's all, you know, I've, I've written all about it. It's, it. It kept me going because there was a lot of interesting things to talk about. There was nothing boring about it. I found one of, I found one of my relatives arrested for laying drunk in a gutter in St. Catharines, Ontario. <laughs> I didn't bother including that in the book. But, you know, there's always some <laughs> issues like that along the way. But and one of John McCombs, my third great grandfather, helped build the Welland Canal, so he he had some engineering background. I was trying to find people like myself. Some of I read about it and I said, well, it strikes home a bit. It's a bit like me. You know, obviously we are a combination of, of many people, but I found it interesting. I probed to see what, what characteristics do, do they have that I that I may have, and I found some, and I talk about it in, in the book. Again, throughout the book, well, throughout the book, I, as I said, I, I was always looking for a reason to be. Why do I exist, and what good can I do you know, with the rest of my life? And I'm I'm still searching for that, but I I found some ways, and I think I'm helping best I can. One of the I wanted to mention, I want to make sure I mentioned before we get off about the proceeds of this book is are all going to the Alzheimer's Association, who does wonderful work. Unfortunately, we don't have a cure yet, but they help so many people. So anything that any proceeds from this book is going to them. Wow, that's. That's such a phenomenal gesture to contribute pr- the proceeds from that book to that cause. And that just goes to show how dedicated and committed you are to the fight against Alzheimer's disease. Now, I want to ask you, in the process of publishing your book, what was that process like? Was it easy to publish your book? Did you hit any roadblocks along the way? Well, it, it was obviously brand new to me. And... I found a good publisher, Greenleaf, and they they made it pretty painless. They're really good people, and they 
they led me along the way. I learned a lot. I think I could write a book about publishing. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to it. I'm not. It's not for the faint-hearted. You better pick up your mind to stick with it, finish it. It's not something you just start and stop with. You just have to keep at it. And there are days when you run into a blank wall. Blank sh- in engineering, I've also often told many of my students and mentees that in my lifetime, I've found that the most exciting thing in the thing to see have in front of you is a blank sheet of paper, but it's also the scariest thing. But in, in research and development where I spend my life, that clean sheet of paper is still exciting to me. And so when you're writing, you've got that clean sheet of paper in front of you, you just have to start writing. And what comes, comes. And it, it seems to develop in the thought process. And you, you know when you're saying it right, and you, and you know when you're getting it wrong. So I've learned a lot in the process, and I'm since I'm writing my actual memoir now, I've decided to do that. I've been asked to do it by some universities to show how I bridge the gap from my personal experience to my creativity, which I'm finding yeah. very difficult yeah. to do. <laughs> well, I'm sure it is because you probably have a lifetime of accolades and achievements. So. One of the things I want to ask you, as you say, you know, as you've been trying, as you were trying to go through the process, and like you said, you hit a couple of roadblocks because it was something new that you were learning, and which that happened to us, right? Life, life is a, a whole lot of trial and error, <laughs> right? We, and we wish we could just try something once and get it right. But what's the best advice someone has ever given you? Gosh. It's a very difficult question. I'd like to think that I got it from my parents, but I didn't really. Be my I was my parents were grand grandparents' age to me. There's certain teachers that I've had that encouraged me to stay with it, to not give up. It was the same with coaches and sports. That just stay with it, don't give up, and I. I, I was a gifted child, and I didn't know that until I went to high school. And so I was at a lot of support from that point. And I think that just making me aware of the fact that the sky was the limit, that just just keep keep working at it and you're going to be successful. I can't pin that point. Well, I definitely can agree with you. That is great advice if you do stick with something and eventually you will achieve success at it. So. I agree. <laughs> but don't, well, Norman, but don't start don't don't start down a path that you know nothing about. However, okay, so don't start <laughs> writing about something you don't know anything about, or try to invent something you know nothing about. First, you must make sure that you can see your way through to the end. I think maybe that's the best advice I, I've ever heard. But before you start, make sure you can see through see it through to the end that you, you're going to be able to, you, that you know enough to complete it. Maybe bl- blanks you have to fill along the way, but in the end you have enough knowledge to see your way through to the end. And that's where the joy of life comes from. And that's the same with relationships. I was, I thought that with grace we would see it through to the end together, but it, it wasn't meant to be. When as long as we could, we were together since high school. And I, I'll never get over it. I, I think one thing about grief, I don't think we're meant to get over it. It's to just forget about someone or forget about something. It's just that it's immoral to do that. We have to remember, even though it may give you pain. We, we must remember. It's not not something that we can just erase from our minds. It, it, it minimizes the the person, our loved one, and their impact on your life. So you must think about it, but not obsess about it. Wow. Well, you know what, Norm, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Can you do me a favor? Can you take the time to let everyone know how they can purchase a copy of your book? Or what are some things that they can do to get involved with the fight against Alzheimer's disease? As far as Alzheimer's is concerned, get involved with your local Alzheimer's Association. 
donate your time and our money, you know, to support it. What was the other question? <laughs> you and then, of course, how can, they purchase, how can they purchase a copy of your book? For the book, yeah, I, I, I sort of put that to the back, don't I? Actually, I'm, if you look up normanmacombs.com, it's a splash page. It talks about the book. If you go to YouTube, look me up there. I'm just under Norman McCombs. There's a promo video there that, that certain people did a really beautiful job on. It explains the book. The best way to buy it is just go to Amazon, look, look up a reason to be, hardcover, Norman McCombs, and there it is. That's where we're selling them from right now. You can get it through Barnes & Noble as well. But I, I found the most effective way. I become a victim myself of Amazon. <laughs> I buy everything through Amazon, it seems. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's so normanmccombs.com. Or, uh, and I, I'd, I'd encourage people to take a look at YouTube under my name, Norman McCombs, to learn a bit about me and more about the book. And if they're interested enough to read it, buy it through Amazon. Just go to Amazon, look it up, and it, it's there. And I particularly recommend it to people who have suffered, gone through the throes of caring for someone with Alzheimer's. I survived, and I didn't think I would, but I survived. So there's hope. Hope is the important thing. That I'm hoping that we'll come up with a, a cure, but... You know, I'm not sure. We may be right on the eve of it. It may be a long ways away, and I hope we're on the eve of coming up with a solution. But everybody can help by giving with word and deed to Alzheimer's Association. Well, Norman, thank you so much. Any last words of encouragement for the listeners as they strive for more? Go in the direction of your strengths, of your talents, of your, your desires, those things that you like to do. Don't put them off. Do them. Don't put off telling a loved one you love them. Don't put off showing acts of kindness to others. I believe we're all born good, and we all learn bad habits along the way. But in the end, we're, I believe we're all bo born good and kind and practice kindness with others. And it'll come back to you, I believe, in the golden rule. You know, do unto others that you will have them do unto you. If you practice that, you can't go wrong unless you're a masochist, but, but but in general, the golden rule works. Well, Norman, I wish you nothing but blessings and abundance for your future. Please continue to strive for more and take care. Okay. Thank you very much, Ronika. Guess what, everyone? Strive for More podcast show is expanding. We are looking for individuals who are interested in starting a podcast, or maybe you already have a podcast and it's not going quite how you want it to go. We are looking for individuals who are interested in joining our network. If you are interested in starting a podcast, please send me an email at striveformore at email.com. That's strive, S-T-R-I-V-E, the number four, more, M-O-R-E, at email.com. I can't wait to speak with you and together, we can grow your podcast and build a wonderful network for many of the listeners out there. Continue to strive for more and live your best life now. See you in the next episode.